in, in Sheridan and in Buffalo, there's a local foods kind of rumbling. In the world of small farming, there's a movement afoot. Without seed, there's, there is nothing. Small scale farmers around the country are seeing access to one of their most vital resources shrinking. It used to be that every farmer was saving seed and maybe he was trading seed with his neighbors, but in general, everyone was saving seed and now um, that's just not the case. In the last 60 years, a fundamental skill has vanished from the hands of farmers. Until probably the 1950s, there wouldn't have been a need to educate farmers about seed saving because they were all doing it. But with the growth of the agricultural um, industry and the seed industry, particularly after the Green Revolution, you see that seed was sort of taken out of the farmer's hands and put in the hands of seed business and seed companies. In our modern, technology-driven era, food production has become increasingly specialized at the cost of diversity and access. And the farmer, you have to understand, he needed to pay for the equipment. And so he bought into this because he could grow more dependable crops. They were disease resistant, they were prolific, they looked beautiful and they stayed on the shelf in a grocery store for days and days and days as opposed to that seed his grandmother had. Seed Savers on this Farm to Fork Wyoming. Funding for Farm to Fork Wyoming is provided by Wyoming Community Bank, your locally owned community bank in Riverton and Lander, and on the web at www.wyocb.com. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Here's the thing. We want to feed the world. I mean, we want to feed the world. We want to make sure everybody has food. More backyard to mid-scale food producers are realizing they play an important part in our resilience. But we've, what we've got is a world of malnourished obesity. As today's industrial food system champions the cause of feeding the world, local growers are wondering at what cost. There is a lot of uh, focus on let's feed the world which, by the way, I don't really agree with. I think people should feed themselves and to be let alone to do that. And if they need help doing something because they're going to starve, then people need to be fed. But you, that is not something that you have to do all the time because it destroys the economies. In other places, if you provide food from what? How many thousands of miles does the food go now? Many argue that increased production has brought us more food, but less security. We're not growing seeds for taste and nutrition. We are growing them for storage and transportation. And so you're getting empty calories, you're getting less nutrition, but they're beautiful. You're getting a longer store life, a longer storage life, but they're beautiful and we're getting disease resistant Nothing wants it. The bugs do not want it. We shouldn't either. So there's a growing effort to take food back into our own hands. The Campbell County Master Gardeners opened this seed library in 2016 to provide a service to our community. I think that there's been a shift in our culture and I think it's been really interesting to watch in terms of like younger people, millennials, looking to the past as a way to maybe find some security. So here you can come and you can, you know, get rid of that risk of buying seed because here you can check out seed for free and if it doesn't work, you're not out any money. I mean, with the world that we're living in, with technology, all these things, things are very different and I think that we find an element of security from traditions, from self-sufficiency, things that we've kind of lost over the years. And we also wanted to do a small part to play in addressing food insecurity in our community. Um, with some families in Gillette, like money is tight and you might not have, if you have to choose between buying groceries or buying a pack of seeds, you might not choose to buy a pack of seeds. So you can come here, check out seeds for free, and give it a go in your own garden and see if they grow and work for you. You see a lot of women or a lot of people just in general who are interested in canning or keeping chickens or seed saving or having a garden and there's really something's going on in the culture that is making us look to these sorts of things and I think that that's part of the lo larger sort of, you know, with globalization and technology, it's a way to find a little bit of security. 
It's not that I want Big Ag to go away. I want there to be a lot of balance so that we, people like me, that are very interested in plants that are natural, not modified, that we save those things. Traditional, unpatented, open-pollinated seeds are the starting point for many. So then this is a black tomato, and then we've got another sort, I mean, just there's two drawers. That there is attention paid to saving those things along with whatever's going on in conventional agriculture. No one can do it all, and the way I look at it is that we need a diversity of, of options, um, as well as a diversity of varieties. Mm -hmm. So. If we only have one option and that option is to buy seed from a big agribusiness company, then we're just limiting our, our possibilities. What happens when that business gets bought by another one and all of a sudden they retire the varieties that worked for Wyoming wheat growers or things like that, then people are left in the lurch. I know some of these Hopi black beans I've donated. These are those ones from that defunct seed company. I think it's important to always have that diversity um, at every level, even at the business level. I think that's a much better way and a better way for survival than it would be to become more of a monoculture in seeds. So while seed technology has helped attain more food with less farmers, it has come at the cost of freedom and genetic diversity. They're really good at what they do. They're really good at what they do, but they don't do everything. I think, and I think that that's what we need to remember, is that there are other markets that they're not addressing. There are other grow, there are growers that they're not addressing. There's, there are research questions that they're not even asking. What was once shaped in the hands of many is now guided by only a few. On many levels, diversity shrivels away. So first of all, your agribusiness is not interested in small crops or crops that, that are important for very specific regions. Extreme weather, I mean, we have, yesterday it was 22 in the morning and it was 74 in the afternoon. They're not interested in crops that are sort of outside the purview in you know your Walmarts or, or your normal grocery stores. We grow. French filet beans, and they're only about two inches long. So you're not gonna be able to find these really interesting purple carrots or these really interesting, you know, tiny green eggplants. Well, we do have a lot of varieties. We grow just about anything you possibly can grow in Wyoming, or we keep trying it anyway. I have okra seeds. I could grow okra. So things like that, you know, most, most big agribusiness is not is not going to be geared toward thinking that those are interesting crops, whereas farmers are experimenters. What we're working on is uh, kind of winter harvesting. So these we put out, I think the first of April. But here we haven't done anything, and look at how, I mean, it was down to 18 here. Nothing on them for the windows. So we now know that these would be good cultivars to save seed for. They love to try new things, to see what's gonna work, what might do better, and eaters are the same way. Uh, kids, kids are great. Kids love purple peppers. <laughs> so when people see those kinds of new crops in, in commercial markets, or even just at the farmer's market, I think people get really excited about it. So what we do is we're trying to broaden people's brains. <laughs> And that feedback is really important to making farmers try new varieties and say, oh, well, let's try these, these different crops. So that's one way that, that having control over your seed is gonna, is gonna increase biodiversity. I don't think people realize that the whole entire historical, biological time capsules in those little guys. I just think we ought to really educate ourselves about seeds about what they mean, about how important they are, and to have a great diversity of plants and seeds in our environment. Well, you know, seed is life. A seed is, is everything you need for it. And without seeds, we'd all starve to death. 
Seed banks have been developed in response to the loss of genetic diversity. In Svalbard in Norway, they have, they have a seed bank, it's called ex situ, so those seeds are no longer being renewed. You know, they are purely just storing the seed. So, you know, I mean, Syria has been so war-torn and, and their seed bank is now is now gone, but a lot of the seed is still in Svalbard and, you know, hopefully when things calm down, they will be able to reaccess that. But then there are also other kinds of seed banks where really what they're doing is continuing to regenerate the seed year after year to ensure that it doesn't just die in the seed bank. Of course, the USDA germplasm system also stores a lot of seed, but they also do have a regeneration program, so they're growing out the seed. Those are really important resources for, for preserving germplasm and genetic diversity that, that can be accessed. You know, we live on about 150 crops worldwide, that's it. So developing many different varieties, you keep the biodiversity alive. You wanna keep biodiversity because remember the Irish potato famine. They grew a potato, it was wonderful, it was great, it was very productive, it was a hardy potato and then it got a fungus. Because one seed didn't make it, thousands of people died or immigrated from their country. It's really the loss of knowledge around how to steward a variety, how to make sure that that variety stays true, doesn't decrease in quality, doesn't decrease in resilience. Uh, that kind of knowledge has also been widely lost. So today, there are groups working to restore traditional plant breeding and seed saving among small producers for the public domain. So I think the movement really comes from farmers who want to, to exercise their right to save that seed. They know that that's an input. They know that it's the most important piece of what they do. Without the seed, there is no crop. A lot of the other inputs, you would still get something. You know, if you, if you suddenly take away fertilizer, you're still going to be able to grow some kinds of crops. You're still going to be able to get something out of your land. But without seed, there's, there is nothing. Now, there's a revived interest in traditional seed stewardship. There are smaller seed companies, small to mid-sized seed companies. There are companies now that just work with saving seeds and making seeds available from the little guy that, that invented the mortgage lifter tomato, you know, and, and the, you know, crazy, you know, named things. Seed libraries, there are seed exchanges, there's like the Indigenous Seed Network, those folks are doing a lot of work. Because the food security we have today still rests on the genetic diversity built by farmers through thousands of years of selective seed saving. Thank God there are these little little farmers saving seeds, because without them we would have absolutely nothing. Because you have to have an open pollinated seed to even play with when you want to hybrid it. So thank goodness that there are people that have done this all over the world. The other people that I think we often forget about and we really shouldn't are the public universities. Land grant universities were established for the purpose of increasing our knowledge about agriculture. And there are still public universities that have plant breeding programs that are in danger of losing those programs, and we need them. That is where so much of the germplasm that all of the other folks who are doing breeding projects comes from, is from those universities. These are all efforts to offset a growing trend in restrictive ownership of genetic diversity through patent overreach. So this is all about like giving it back to the people. I mean, we're basically like wanting to democratize seed. We really believe in putting seed back in the hands of farmers, making sure that they are able to exercise their rights um, and their responsibilities to, to provide and steward seed and good varieties for organic systems. We do that through research, so conducting variety trials, doing plant breeding, um, and also through education, so teaching people how to, how to do these practices. Here's our first seed experiment for this spring. Teaching workshops on seed production. This is just the pea patch. Hey, and here's the deal. They bloom at different times. Some are very early, some are very late, so you're not cross-pollinating at all. 
also some some technical expertise to make sure that people know how how many plants do you need to keep to maintain a population how do you do the selection and roguing lettuce will sometimes bolt early and so you might be in a rush and like oh here it's bolting it's going to produce seed i want to save seed from that don't save seed from your best healthiest plants that have the traits that you want what does it look like to run a variety trial on your farm how much work is it how do you take that data and then make it meaningful? This restoration of knowledge is key to maintaining and increasing these shared seed resources. Meanwhile, seed libraries for the public are cropping up all over. So we have a bunch of different tomato varieties. And the important thing to remember about the seed library is we can only take um, open pollinated varieties. So we can't take any seed that's been patented or, or that's GMO seed because we are sharing these seeds for free. So urban gardening, I mean, there's a lot out there for urban gardening. I mean, um, grow food, teach your children where it comes from. For goodness sake, everybody can grow food. It, it's nothing, it takes nothing. You put a seed in the ground. And so when we get donations from seed companies, we do let them know like this seed is gonna be shared for free with the community. So that's why we only accept the open pollinated varieties. While Gillette Seed Library is housed at the local Ag Extension Office, seed libraries are proliferating in public libraries across the country. Okay, so this is the seed catalog. This is where all the seeds live. Um, and so they're kind of organized. So this is vegetables and herbs start here and flowers. Um, everything's organized alphabetically and then by variety. So if you came in here, you could say we've got beans. Um, and so this is like a Blue Lake pole bean. It's got all the information, scientific name, days to maturity. And then this um, sticker here um, indicates um, ease of saving. So green is easy. What's really important with libraries is the community. Um, we're the space for that. And we're a place that's open to everyone, regardless of class, regardless of position. I mean your county commissioner down to somebody who doesn't have a home. We're all in this space together and that's what makes us really unique. And so we have to really be conscious of that and we have to provide access for everyone. But I feel like the other part of access is sharing and the seeds are an extension of that because they're, they're knowledge, they're tools, they're, um, they're something that we all use. We all eat food, we all consume things and it's really just another way to empower people with knowledge and food. And guess what? You could harvest some of it, you isolate a plant, or you just pick the best plant you have, the best tomato, and then you save that seed. Like here's a green tomato. Um, and the thing for us is our growing seasons are so, sh are so short, right? So like this one, um, 85 days is a long time for us. So we want kind of things, we want to get things down to the 60 range usually for tomatoes. Eventually, we'd like to create seeds that are acclimated and adapted to our climate so that when you check out a seed from our seed library, you know it's gonna grow well here because it's been saved from a member of our community, brought back to the seed library, and then you can use it and grow it in your garden. And so that's part of like adapting. And see, this one's better, 77 days. So, and then you'll see with the yellow sticker that this it's instead of easy, it'd be like an intermediate, but it's still pretty easy. Yeah. Regional adaptation is, is so important, um, particularly for regions that are underserved by agribusiness. We're such a unique, like we're a microclimate, and there's not a lot of information on like our zones and how short our growing season is, and so there's some unique challenges to seed saving here and gardening here. Most of the farmers that we work with are not in the Corn Belt. So they're not really being thought of in terms of, of what kinds of crops should be grown. Now these all survived very nicely when it was about 24 degrees down here in the hardening off shed. It is this simple process in the hands of many through the previous 11,000 years that has created the vast majority of crop adaptations enjoyed around the world today. We saved a lot of these seeds, but all of them are definitely heirlooms. Every, no, open pollinated, some are heirlooms. There were some winter peas that a gentleman saved that um, survived that 40 below cold snap we had last winter. So now we have, and he's like, I don't know how they lived, but they lived. And so, you know, that's, but that's how we're getting these adaptations. That's how these things are happening. And so now we have those available in the seed library. 
you know, so maybe it's not an impossible dream to grow in winter. <laughs> Plants have a variety of life strategies that make some easier to save seed from than others. So we have 27 different gardens and we have it spread out quite a ways. We do seed savings in a couple of different ways. One of them is we rotate so when something is in bloom, the other one isn't. So if you're growing two kinds of beans, one comes to bloom first and then the other. So you can save the seed from the first one because you don't want cross-pollination. The other thing too is like we can plant something this far away and I have a chart that tells you how far away you can plant for seed saving, you know. Mm -hmm. Or if you only plant one cultivar, like one kind of pea, mm -hmm. then you that, that seed's fine. Some of the things like with cross-pollination and stuff like that, that's a little more advanced. You aren't necessarily thinking about squash and pumpkins cross-pollinate. And so I saved those seeds and the next year I, I didn't know what I had. So if you do want to save seeds from squash, you do have to isolate the blossoms and self, you preferably will self-pollinate those um, with like a cotton swab or something, you'd isolate that blossom so then you'd know that you're getting a true to type seed from that plant. There are crops that are mostly self-pollinating and then there are crops that are that are mostly crossing and then there's sort of everything in between. So mostly self-pollinating crops would be things like lettuce and peas and mostly outcrossing would be brassicas. Brassicas are the hardest. That would be cauliflower and Brussels sprouts and those things. And corn, for example. Um, and then in between there are things like tomatoes and, and cucumbers and all of those things. So, you know, these two groups of plants have different life strategies. Um, in corn, if you, if you self-pollinate corn all the time, you know, we see really severe inbreeding depression. The sh plants get shorter, the yield gets to be less. That doesn't happen in plants like peas. The more you inbreed them, you know, we don't see that kind of change. And the easiest seeds to save, this is what we tell people, are peas, beans, lettuce, tomatoes, and peppers. So if you're new to seed saving, those are the five varieties to start with first. For, for plants that are mostly self-pollinating, you have to have a perfect flower. So you have to have the stigma and the anthers on the same flower. And very often what you'll find is that that flower has those things enclosed together. So peas very often will have the stigma and the anther are closed together. For other crops like corn that are, that are highly encouraging crossing, you'll find temporal or spatial differences in flowers. So on corn, you have the male flower, which is the tassel on the top, and you have the female flower, which is the silk on the bottom of the plant. And that spatial separation helps encourage pollination from neighboring plants. So very often you'll have the wind blow pollen from your neighbor onto the silk of the plant next to it. This ease of cross-pollination is cause for much concern in regards to GMO corn crops spreading their DNA among non-GMO varieties. In corn, it's a, it's a huge possibility. I mean, you know, most conventional corn is genetically modified. So for growers who are trying to grow organic corn seed, it's a huge challenge to ensure that they are not getting that, that cross-pollination happening. I feel like that's a lot of institutional knowledge that goes along with, with just with seed saving in general. And so I kind of wanted to extract that knowledge out of the community that we already have and have it housed in a place where everybody can access that. In seed vaults, they serve a purpose in that they're preserving the seed for long term. But we want the seed out in the community and in people's hands so that they're comfortable with seed, they're growing the seed, and they're saving seed, and they're bringing it back to the seed library. So somebody that you've never met can then check out seed that you've donated and grow it in their garden. And that just continues the cycle. So part of our mission statement is to create a culture of sharing, and that's really what we're trying to foster here. Yeah, well, and this belongs to the community. This is for the community, and that's why it belongs in the library and heirloom seeds are a favorite among these community collections. A regular heirloom seed is just defined really as open pollinated. It's just pollinated by nature one way or another and uh, it's been like that for who knows how long. Producers like Prairiana and Lower Piney also steward seeds for their community. It's really nice when somebody does come up with uh, some pepper seeds or tomato seeds and says, here, try these, did we like them? And so we try them and it's, you know, they're ones that they've had for a long time.
Well, and everything has a story, and that's also another interesting thing. Like, we have a form that when people donate seeds, we ask them to fill out, and then at the very bottom, we're like, is there anything that you would like us to know about these seeds? Is there anything you would like us to include in terms of, like, an anecdote or a story? Because I feel like that's just as important as the seeds themselves, because that's part of our history. That's what's so neat about heirlooms is because people come to the farmer's market and they'll go, this just tastes exactly like my grandmother's green beans. You know, so that's very rewarding. There was one where a gentleman was, um, he had saved seeds while he was in World War II and he brought them back. And then his daughter had them and then his granddaughter. And so that's something that we've seen. We've also had people being like, I remember my grandmother, you know, germinating these seeds in tea towels on the counter. You know, some people have this old family bean that they've grown for years and they say, you know, we live in town, I don't have a place to keep them. Some seeds that were donated, they were like, we, you know, the woman who donated them said they were saved by this family who had passed away. And so we decided to name the variety after the family. Another lady who, who is quite ill, fighting cancer, and she has this corn that she wants preserved. People do still have them out there, we just don't know, and they don't know that people want their seeds. Well, and interestingly too, seeds and by default food can be political, and so that's really interesting how those two things are, you know, you don't necessarily think about what you're eating and, you know, the scarcity or the abundance. That, that, that biodiversity is a cultural diversity thing. A friend of mine who, um, grew up um, peppers from Aleppo. And so those are very rare. And so you didn't think she never really occurred to her that to grow these peppers is political. And it's an act of kind of, it's a conscious act of saving these, these foods. People, people are really wonderful in, in giving us seeds to try to keep going. I think being more seed aware is, you know, can only mean good for our local communities. Keep growing them and, and, you know, keep adapting them to new environments. Who knows how well a seed from 100 years ago would do today. The climate has changed, um, our management practices have changed. We need varieties that, that are growing with our systems um, and growing with our changing climate. This episode of Farm to Fork Wyoming is available for $25. Order online at shop.wyomingpbs.org. To learn more and watch Wyoming PBS programs online, visit us at wyomingpbs.org. This program was produced by Wyoming PBS, which is solely responsible for its content.